Okay, good morning, everybody. Can I welcome you all to the 21st meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2014? Uh, can I remind everybody that uh, electronic devices, particularly mobile phones, should be switched off at all times because they do interfere with the broadcasting system? Uh, and can I welcome Liz Smith back to the committee? Um, I know that Liz is here for the uh, stage two, which we'll come to uh, shortly. However, our first item today is to decide whether to take item five in private, which is to consider our approach to the curriculum for excellence. Do members agree? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, item two, our next item, is to take evidence on the Public Appointments and Public Bodies, etc. Scotland Act 2003, Treatment of Historic Environment Scotland as Specified Authority, Order 2014. Can I welcome Fiona Hislop, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture and External Affairs, uh, and her supporting officials from the Scottish Government to committee this morning. Welcome to you all. Um, after we have taken evidence on the instrument, we will debate the motion in the name of the Cabinet Secretary at item three. Officials, of course, are not permitted to contribute to that formal debate. And can I uh, invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a, any opening remarks? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, this order has been prepared to ensure that the appointments to Historic Environment Scotland will be regulated by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland. The instrument provides that Historic Environment Scotland is for the purposes of or in connection with appointments to that body to be treated as if it were a specified body listed in Schedule 2 to the Public Appointments and Public Bodies etc. Scotland Act 2003. As I stated when I wrote to the committee in May, it has been our policy position from the start that the new body should be a, a regulated body. As set out in the accompanying documents to the Historic Environment Scotland Bill, stage two of which follows this item of business, it is my intention that the new body will be established in April 2015 and take up its full powers in October 2015. In order to have uh, the board in place and in a position to carry out the work to meet this timetable and to meet uh, the Audit Scotland recommendations on establishing and merging public bodies, uh, I wish to appoint a board as soon as possible after the bill receives royal assent, should of course Parliament approve approve that. This is particularly important if the board is to have sufficient time to recruit the chief executive before the organisation takes up its full powers in October 2015. I believe that it is important that the appointment process for the first board, which will become our new lead body for the historic environment, is fully transparent and subject to the high quality of external scrutiny which the Commissioner can provide. In addition of Historic Environment Scotland to the schedule of the 2003 Act, which the order does, follows recent precedent when setting up new public bodies. Um, the Commissioner cannot formally regulate the appointments until the new body is added to the list of regulated bodies under the Public Appointments and Public Bodies um, Act 2003, which is what I'm proposing to do through this order, um, for which I invite the committee's support. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, can I invite members uh, to indicate if there are any questions they wish to ask? Uh, Mary Scanlon. Yes, uh, thank you for that. It was uh, very clear. I was just uh, looking at the policy note, paragraph 6, and uh, it was just to ask if you're on course to have the leadership of this new body in place by the 1st of October, six months prior to... April, yeah, that, that, that's the intention, and that's why we want to move forward as swiftly as possible. But we've obviously got to recognise, and we should recognise, the role of Parliament. So obviously we've waited to stage one, and indeed there are a number of amendments here relating to the board that we're about to go into. So we've actually waited, and we're waiting until we get through this process before we're, we're ready to move and ready to advertise. Uh, but obviously the appointments are subject to the bill being passed finally at stage three. Can I just for absolute clarity that the, the appoint none of the appointments will be actually... Uh, confirmed until after Parliament's completed stage three? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you look at what was happening with um, other bodies, they're subject to, they're always subject to, um, so you can go through the process, but obviously if at the end of the day, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the committee won't, but if, or the Parliament won't, but if, uh, if at the end of the day there was something happened at the final stage, then obviously the, 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 you know, the, 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 the board commitment, the commitments can't, can't, can't take place. Any other members wish to make a comment or a question at this time? No? OK. Um, as indicated, we now move to the formal debate on the instrument, which is item three. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion? Um, I move the motion. Thank you very much. Uh, contributions from members? Anybody wish to make any contribution at this stage? OK. Uh, I don't suppose you wish to respond to that, Cabinet Secretary? <laughs> Thank you. Can I uh, put the agreed, mo agreed question that uh, the motion S4M 10644 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think most of you will be staying for the uh, stage two, which is the next item on our uh, agenda. <coughs> uh, 
Now, our next item is to consider the Historic Environment Scotland Bill at Stage 2. Um, can I remind officials that they are not permitted to participate, obviously, in, in this part of the proceedings? Can I also remind everybody that uh, they should have the, with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the marshalled list uh, of amendments and the groupings of amendments. The grouping set out the amendments in the order in which they will be debated. The marshalled list sets out the amendments in the order in which they will be disposed of. Um, I will quickly remind uh, all those present some of the main points of the procedure uh, so we are clear. There will be a debate on each group of amendments and I will call members to speak in turn. Members who have not lodged amendments in a group but who wish to speak should indicate that by catching either my eye or the clerk's attention. Uh, following the debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the First Amendment in the group wishes to press or withdraw it, and if they wish to press ahead, I will put that question on that amendment. If a member wishes to withdraw that amendment after it has been moved, they must seek approval to do so. If any member uh, who is pre here present objects, the committee will immediately then move to a vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say not moved. However, any other member may move uh, such an amendment. Uh, if no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Uh, voting in any division is by a show of hands. Only committee members are allowed to vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it has considered and agreed each section of the bill, and so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. Uh, I will now move on to uh, the uh, section two of the bill itself, uh, and the first question is that the question is that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Uh, can I call amendment six in the name of Liam MacArthur in a group on its own? Uh, Liam MacArthur to move and speak to amendment six. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Can I start by re-emphasising my support for the general principles of this bill and also acknowledge uh, the willingness of the cabinet secretary to, uh, to engage constructively uh, on uh, the, uh, the provisions in this bill. I uh, can also thank uh, colleagues on the committee for including in our uh, evidence gathering uh, sessions a visit to Orkney because I think um, there are probably few other parts of the country that can lay um, uh, as much of a claim um, to being uh, directly impacted by the, uh, by, by the implications of this bill uh, as the constituency I represent. Um, well, we've heard uh, no real opposition, as I say, to the, the principles of the merger. What we have heard, I think it's fair to say, is a consistent anxiety about the need to ensure that this uh, new body is equipped and tasked with dealing with a wide range of needs of stakeholders across the country. Uh, invariably, if not inevitably, merging organisations can lead to a more centralised approach, one that looks good on paper, has the benefit of simplicity, but which in practice fails to represent the interests of all those it is set up to serve and or struggles to reflect the complexity of issues and tasks for which it's responsible. Uh, a number of my amendments being considered this morning are born out of a desire to ensure uh, Historic Environment Scotland does not fall into this category. Uh, again, to be fair to uh, the Cabinet Secretary, I think she recognises and accepts some of those risks and will come on shortly to some of those uh, amendments uh, in due course. Uh, in terms of Amendment 6, however, and we've already uh, discussed um, the mechanics for putting in place the new board, uh, the concern here is to ensure that HES embodies the, the geographic diversity for which it is responsible. I accept that appointing a board that it has the necessary mix of skills, uh, balances appropriate male and female representation and any other factors that might be relevant is not at all straightforward. Nevertheless, I think the integrity and legitimacy uh, of HES could only be enhanced were it to be seen to be drawn from the talents of individuals from across the country uh, rather than simply those who are uh, already within easy striking distance of Edinburgh, however well qualified uh, they may be. I don't, as I say, underestimate the challenges this amendment might present, particularly if the numbers uh, on any future board are to be kept manageable. Uh, but I do think that some of the concerns felt, particularly by people living outside the central belt, about the consequences of merger could be allayed uh, by a move along these lines. So I look forward to hearing what Fiona Hislop has to say, but for now, um, move Amendment 6 in my name. Thank you very much. Any other member wish to contribute to this debate? Uh, Claire Adamson. Um, uh, can I just um, reiterate um, the, the comments about the support for the bill I, I, and also reference that beautiful sunny trip to Orkney that we had and absolutely appreciate the complexity um, of, of, of the situation in Orkney. However, I do feel that um, 
in its very nature, getting the right candidate will be people who understand the complex nature of Scotland's historic environment. And I think to, to include this may limit the choices and put an emphasis on selection of candidate that, that wouldn't end up with the best possible people in place. Thank you very much. Um, if I make a, a small contribution myself, um, I think the principle is absolutely laudable. I think that you know, we all would certainly want to make sure there, were, um, there was geographical diversity as well as other diversity on any board that is being appointed um, in the name of the public. But I think uh, my concern would be that to put um, such a, uh, an amendment into the bill, into legislation, um, would create um, unnecessary difficulties. I think this is something perhaps that um, it should be an aim and should, should perhaps something that should be uh, discussed in, in terms of possible guidance. But uh, I, I'm unsure, certainly, that it would be something you'd want to see actually on the face of the bill. Um, and with that, can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Um, thank you very much. Uh, clearly, Liam MacArthur has proposed the geographical diversity should be a, a factor of which special account is taken when selecting board members for Historic Environment Scotland. And certainly, you know, I agree, an understanding of the circumstances and issues in all areas of Scotland will be important, but I'm not convinced that it should be the overriding uh, consideration in appointing the board, and that's what you would do by putting this in specifically. Our intention is to ensure a diverse uh, mix of background, skills and experience that will best serve Historic Environment Scotland, the wider Historic Environment in Scotland, and we'll not get that by restricting um, which candidates we can choose. Historic Environment Scotland has a broad range of responsibilities within the general function of investing, investigating, caring for and promoting Scotland's uh, historic environment. And actually, despite representations from some stakeholders, we chose not to specify particular fields of expertise, for example, archaeology. And I think the same argument applies for geographical or indeed other factors. Um, we need to get the widest possible field to get the best possible board. Um, that won't necessarily happen if potential candidates perceive that they are less likely to be chosen if they live in, say, Glasgow as opposed to Orkney. And equally, if a specific number of board members must come from or have significant interests within certain geographical locations, we could end up in a position that, that we're unable to appoint the candidates which best meet the other assessment criteria simply because they are based in the wrong part of Scotland. The committee has just considered um, the order which allows HES to be regulated by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life. Uh, criteria have been developed by the appointment panel, which includes the Commissioner's uh, independent assessor, and I think that best needs, meets the needs of the body. Um, we need the right criteria, and um, we want good candidates to put themselves forward from every part of uh, Scotland and beyond. I would emphasise that those selected will receive support with travelling and other expenses so they can play a full part in the board, and indeed MSPs themselves have a role in encouraging applications from all parts of, of Scotland, including islands and, uh, more, um, and, and, and other areas um, that we want to make sure that we have good representation from. But from, from the reasons I've set out, I firmly believe we should trust the Commissioner and the selection panel in helping identify the best possible board. I'm very conscious in all board appointments of making sure that we have a representation across Scotland and of the skills that are identified um, by the selection panel. And taking all these relevant factors into account, I, I would urge the committee to oppose this amendment. Okay, thank you very much. Can I uh, call Liam MacArthur uh, to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw this amendment? Uh, thank you, Convener, and thank you for your contribution and, and, and to clear it. I think I, I fully accept some of the reservations that have been uh, expressed in relation to um, the potential straitjacket, I suppose, that, that this creates uh, in terms of establishing the board. I think um, those responsible for, for, for that, uh, that, that, that process uh, will have heard uh, what's been said. I think in terms of the organisation itself, it's inconceivable that you wouldn't have expertise in the area of archaeology. I think actually in terms of the, the, uh, the board makeup as well, um, it, it would only enhance and strengthen the board were it be, to be seen to be drawing uh, from uh, as wide a representation of, of, of the expertise that there is right across uh, Scotland. And I'm reassured by, by some of the provisions are there to ensure that those who are perhaps um, coming from furthest away are not disadvantaged as a result. But I think for the time being, and we'll come on to maybe some other amendments which um, may be more appropriate for the, the context of the bill, but for the moment I will not uh, move Amendment 6. No, I'm sorry. You're, you, you, did move, you, you already moved I've it. I've already moved it, so I'll withdraw it. You, you seek to withdraw. Yeah. Uh, the, the member has, uh, has asked to withdraw the amendment. Are, uh, are the committee... Does anybody object to that? Uh, no objections. Move on.
Uh, can I call Amendment 7 in the name of Liam MacArthur, a group with Amendment 8. Uh, Liam MacArthur, to move Amendment 7 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. The uh, two amendments in this grouping touch on an issue that, that did arise during the committee's visit to um, a sun-kissed Orkney uh, all those weeks ago, uh, albeit it was perhaps less uh, of a concern than some others will come on to. Uh, in a sense, the purpose of Amendments 7 and 8 is to maintain standards of accountability and quality when work is delegated or contracted out, for example, uh, to local authorities. Uh, this would be achieved through the Bill placing a general duty upon HES. Uh, colleagues on the trip to Orkney may recall that one of the potential risks highlighted by representatives of Orkney Islands Council was that technical processes undertaken objectively by HES could become susceptible to politicking within a local authority uh, environment. I suspect the Cabinet Secretary may well feel that the assurances being sought here are already covered in the context of the general operation and accountability of public bodies. However, uh, I, I think it would be useful to hear how this might be expected to work in practice. Likewise, I note that there are specific safeguards being proposed in a later grouping of amendments where a change to the system of delegation of properties and care would see bodies other than HES being required to be on a list of approved organisations. Uh, this, I understand, would uh, allow for vetting, for quality, accountability, etc., to take place before anybody is permitted to take on responsibility for properties and care. The sy system does seem to be sensible uh, and may have mileage for application in other situations. But for now, uh, I move Amendment 7 and again look forward to what the Cabinet Secretary and others have to say. Okay. Um, any other members wish to contribute to this group? No, OK. Can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Um, thank you. I, I must say, I, I wasn't quite sure where this amendment was, uh, these amendments were, were coming from, um, and it's helpful to hear Liam MacArthur um, explain what he's, he's trying to achieve. Um, what, what my view is, though, that uh, it, this the amendment comes um, in a way that actually goes directly contrary to how we intend historic environment uh, Scotland to operate, particularly in its duty of accountability, which I think is what Liam MacArthur was trying to identify. This part of Schedule 1 deals specifically with the way in which Historic Environment Scotland will discharge its own functions as given it to, uh, given it to it by the Bill. And it is dealing with a, a matter quite different from Sections 3 and 7, which deal with delegation of ministerial functions to HES, and that's a, a separate matter. The central purpose of HES is to be the expert lead body to carry out the functions which are currently carried out by Historic Scotland on behalf of ministers and by ARCAMS, and which the bill will transfer to Historic Environment Scotland. And we don't believe that it is either desirable, it's desirable that HES should be able to delegate the functions as given it to, uh, given to it by this bill to other persons, because to do so would involve an unacceptable loss of ministerial and indeed parliamentary oversight and the risk of obscuring lines of responsibility for delivering reporting and accountability. And for that reason, paragraph 12 of Schedule 1 to the Bill, which sets out the general powers of HES, including a vi wide variety of ways in which it can set about delivering its functions, does not allow uh, formal delegation of its functions to others. There is um, a significant difference between working in partnership or indeed entering into formal contracts, um, for example, and the formal delegation of functions into the control and responsibility of another person. So in order that this committee, and indeed I, can have oversight of Historic Environment Scotland and to guarantee that they are carrying out their functions, uh, we think it's very important that the functions can um, uh, be delegated uh, only to Historic Environment Scotland and they should not have power to delegate those functions as given in this bill to anyone other than uh, a HES board member or indeed a HES employee. So in short, the functions given to Historic Environment Scotland should remain with Historic Environment Scotland, though, as we might go on later, we want them to exercise that collaboratively. And actually doing um, any, in terms of working with any other bodies in contracts, that sets out what required in contract. And the, what we've set out, I think, is far simpler. It's quite clear that the accountability rests entirely with, um, with me as Minister in, in, in oversight, but also that they have quite clear responsibility for the functions that are given to them, and I would not want them to be able to have be able to delegate the functions from the bill to any other body. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call on Liam MacArthur to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Thank you, uh, Convener. I think, in light of what the Cabinet Secretary has said, and, and particularly the importance of that line of uh, accountability both to, to ministers but also to, to Parliament, I think uh, those are points very well made, and I'm happy to withdraw the amendments on that basis. Uh, the member had indicated he wished, wishes to withdraw Amendment 7. Uh, does anybody object? 
There's no objection. Uh, can I call Amendment 8 in the name of Liam MacArthur? Already debated with Amendment 7. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not move. It's not moved. Can I call Amendment 60 in the name of Liz Smith in a group of its, on its own? Uh, Liz Smith to move and speak to Amendment 60. Thank you, Convener. And can I move Amendment uh, 60 in my name? Uh, when we took uh, evidence at the earlier stages of the bill, the Law Society of Scotland particularly expressed its concerns about the possible conflict of interest between HES's uh, regulatory functions, which would at times influence the giving of grants and its ability to seek grants from other uh, sources. And it cited, for example, the fact that the listing of a building may be uh, of significance in respect of the availability of grants and other financial uh, resources and issues could obviously arise about the role of Historic Environment Scotland in securing this funding if at the same time it's also making uh, grants. So I think there are potential issues about a conflict uh, in respect of HES. Uh, hopefully uh, in the future will be awarded uh, charitable status and that is clearly something that might uh, uh, exercise Oscar. Uh, Amendment 60 is designed to ensure that there are enhanced reporting requirements on HES to ensure that its functions are kept separate and not influenced unduly by any person or interest. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Liz. Uh, any other member wish to? Uh, Lee MacArthur. Briefly, I think Liz Smith uh, quite rightly identifies one of um, the key issues that was raised with us at stage uh, one about the, the potential conflict and whether or not Amendment 60 addresses this or whether um, some uh, sort of revision of it is, is required. I do think that as things stand, the, the, the bill is in need of, of, of tightening up and clarifying in, rela in relation to this point. So. Thank you. Can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Um, thank you. Amendment 16 would impose duties on the Historic Environment Scotland regulatory functions. Uh, I am uh, very aware of the importance of the regulatory functions that HES will carry out and the need for them to continue to be undertaken in the professional and appropriate manner which uh, they are presently. However, this is equally true of all the functions of Historic Environment Scotland, not just the regulatory functions. And as such, the bill currently requires HES to report annually on the exercise of all its functions. And this would, of course, include all of the heritage management functions, such as designation and regulation, which has been put forward in Amendment 60. I'm conscious of the concerns that were expressed during the evidence sessions of Stage 1 that HES might be under pressure to, for example, grow the commercial income at the expense of the regulatory functions. Uh, the bill does not create such a risk. HES has a duty to undertake and report on all of its functions, including designation and regulation, and is required to do so to a high standard. Uh, at Stage 1, I address concerns that HES might treat internal scheduled monument consent applications differently from external ones. I think that's the point that the Smith is making. Historic Scotland already has in place, as I, I set out at stage one um, evidence, a voluntary process which works well. And our commitment to fairness and transparency is demonstrated by the fact that this bill actually strengthens the existing protections, as HES will not uh, enjoy Crown immunity and will have to apply for scheduled monuments consent in the same way as anyone else. And in addition, I intend to set out regulations in due course, requirements for all scheduled monument consent decisions, including those uh, for HES on its own properties, to be published. Um, and that reflects the transparency that the committee asked for in a number of areas. So the transparency of the regulatory functions will be obvious. Um, on the point about um, grants, I also made it quite clear in my response to the committee's report um, that uh, Historic Environment Scotland will not be able to give itself grants. Um, that's another part of the transparency of the process that that compromise that um, Ms Smith is identifying um, wouldn't be available. I'll make it quite clear in terms of the um, government's uh, letter of guidance to uh, the, the body which uh, the, the amount of money that I would publicly want to be available um, for bodies other than Historic Environment Scotland. So that compromise that she's talking about shouldn't exist in that regard. Um, finally, as a, a public body, HES is subject to the normal expectations of high standards and delivery and accountability. Formal complaints procedure will be applied if there are concerns raised, and these can be raised with Historic Environment Scotland, with ministers, uh, with the Scottish Public uh, Services Ombudsman, or ultimately with the courts, and of course at any time this committee has oversight in terms of um, scrutiny from, a, from Parliament. I therefore believe that through the combination of the reporting requirements that are already in the Bill, which are for all the functions, including the regulatory functions, and the normal expectations and statutory obligations of HES as a public body, that there are sufficient safeguards to ensure that HES picks up 
where Historic Scotland leaves off, uh, carrying out its regulatory functions in an appropriate manner and to a high standard. And as I said, in terms of um, the requirements I'll set out in regulations, we will also have to publish uh, requirements uh, for all scheduled monument consents to, uh, to be published, and that would allow the scrutiny that I think people are looking and seeking for from this amendment. So in that regard, I, I would suggest that the committee oppose the amendment. I'm um, having listened to the argument. Uh, thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary, can I call Liz Smith uh, to wind up this debate and indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw Amendment 60? Thank you, Convener. Uh, I, I do, Cabinet, think, Cabinet Secretary, think that there are some issues uh, about the potential uh, conflict of interest which remain. I, I hear what you say in terms of uh, other aspects of the bill which you uh, believe will clarify some of that. When you talk about uh, some of the uh, government uh, regulations, I think it would be helpful uh, ahead of stage three just to ensure that these are uh, extremely clear. If I get that guarantee, then I'm prepared uh, not uh, to, or, uh, sorry, to withdraw the amendment. Um, but I think that there are some concerns about um, just exactly what it would mean in some of the contexts where, as you rightly point out, there could be a commercial interest uh, that could, uh, as I say, have some uh, potential uh, conflict of interest, I think, in the future. So I think these regulations would be extremely important in clarifying exactly what the um, uh, controls would be. Are, are you moving I, or withdrawing? I seek to withdraw. Okay, thank you. The, the member has, uh, is seeking to withdraw Amendment 60. Does anybody object? Uh, there's uh, no objection. Therefore, uh, the question is that Schedule 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I call Amendment 1 in the name of Liam MacArthur in a group on its own? Liam MacArthur to move and speak to Amendment 1. Thank you. Uh, convener colleagues will recall that we deliberated uh, over the case for and against the inclusion of a, a definition of historic uh, environment within the bill. Uh, we, uh, I think, reached the conclusion uh, that such a case was not um, uh, compellingly made, although uh, I think that decision was met with some disappointment in some quarters, not least by the Law Society of Scotland. Uh, more persuasive, uh, however, I think is the Law Society's argument that conserving and enhancing, as set out in Section 2, subparagraph 2E of the Bill R, or at least potentially could be uh, mutually exclusive. To address this and draw a distinction between what could be incompatible functions, uh, rather than simply replace and with or, I felt it might be helpful, indeed clearer, uh, to separate out these two functions uh, of HES into standalone provisions. Uh, I hope the Cabinet Secretary can agree to this relatively minor, but I think nonetheless important uh, clarification and move Amendment uh, Number 1 in my name. No other members indicated they wish to contribute, therefore can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Um, thank you. Uh, Lee MacArthur points out that it's the Scottish Law Society in discussion uh, uh, with others, including um, officials that pointed out that in their evidence at stage one that conservation and enhancement are not at all the same or even necessarily complementary. Now, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but also, like the many stakeholders that were involved, and uh, you recall that a lot of the debate is about um, how we can deliver the strategy that was produced, and a lot of consideration and thought was given in, given to what would be the vision and indeed the aims um, of uh, the, the historic environment strategy for Scotland. Uh, and I and they accepted that conservation enhancements are not an interchangeable term. But we must conserve before we seek to enhance, and we can only enhance when we do not undermine basic conservation. Uh, that was a, uh, brought home to me just only yesterday when I was visiting Hospital House in our growth, where they want to be able to enhance what they have, but they're also very conscious that they've got to conserve what they have as well. So the, the debate that was took place in, in relation to the strategy, which I'm not sure the Scottish Law Society was as involved in as the many other you know, thousands of people that did take part, was that actually that tension is really important that we put that together because they are, you have to be able to be conscious of both to be able to deliver both. Importantly, the strategy in which there's been a great deal of um, discussion um, has an, as one of its aims, and I'll, I'll quote page seven um, of the strategy under the section protecting, and I directly quote, by caring for and protecting the historic environment, ensuring that we can both enjoy and benefit from it and conserve and enhance it for the enjoyment and benefit for future generations. So although people might think this is maybe pedantic in terms of the terminology, there's a genuine debate here about um, whether... I think we both want to try and do the same thing. Um, the issue is if you list them separately, 
does that mean one will get more benefit, more attention than the other one? And actually, by having them deliberately together, um, it makes sure that they, they, they are considered um, uh, together. Uh, in the strategy and also in the bill, conservation and enhancement are placed together precisely because we all recognise that, that inherent tension and that there can be difficult choices to be made. And the pairing of the two together serves as a reminder that when we think about enhancement, we should always think about conservation and vice versa. So having the two terms each in their own line of the bill would not change the functions in any way, they would just reorder them uh, but by separating them I feel we'd be missing the opportunity to send a real signal to Historic Environment Scotland to keep this important um, point always in mind that they, they, that they, they should be seen um, in, in relation to each other and for those, those reasons I'd prefer to remain with the wording in the bill which is consistent with the wording in the strategy and therefore although it might seem pedantic um, I, I prefer if the, the committee um, oppose this bill in this instance. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call Liam MacArthur to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw this, his uh, amendment? Thank you, Convener. I think stage two is, is, is made for pedantry uh, in many <laughs> respects. Um, I, I hear what the, uh, the Cabinet Secretary says, and, and, and I, I can understand it at, at one level, although I, I, I'm not sure necessarily uh, I accept that by having um, conserve and enhance in, in separate lines, in the sense you create a, a hierarchy um, between uh, the two. I think also there is a, a risk that in certain circumstances, um, while conserving prior to enhancing is, is inevitable, there may be instances where you can only conserve a portion um, in order to enhance the, 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 the overall um, uh, building or whatever it is that, uh, that, that, that you're looking uh, to, to, to preserve. So uh, while the other amendments have withdrawn uh, with uh, no view of bringing them back at stage three, I think I'd like to reflect on what Cabinet Secretary has said, maybe have discussions with her and our officials between now and stage three and see if there's something here that, um, uh, that, that, that could be salvaged uh, and then enhanced. Um, but for now, I would... <laughs> I withdraw the amendment uh, number one. Thank you. Um, the uh, member has uh, requested uh, to withdraw the amendment. Does anybody object? Uh, there's no objection. Therefore, can I call amendment nine in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendment ten. Cabinet Secretary to move amendment nine and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, convener, I've made clear my intention that Historic Environment Scotland will continue the existing functions of um, Historic uh, Scotland and the Royal Commission, and these functions are set out in the Bill at Section 2 and in the many changes the Bill makes to the main enactments relating to ancient monuments and listed buildings. I've also made it clear that HES will uh, operate in an uh, even more collaborative mode. In short, that it will be uh, moved to being more of a leader, partner and facilitator within and beyond the sector, and in doing so that HES will respect the huge valuable roles played by others, be that the many private owners of Scotland's heritage, local authorities or voluntary groups. Um, and at stage one and subsequently, and the committee deliberated on this um, area in particular, um, several suggestions were made for improving how this ambition for collaborative working um, is expressed in the bill. Um, the amendments that we have lodged from the government here are based on suggestions from um, Built Environment Forum Scotland and the National Trust for Scotland. HES will work with all parties in a, a very wide range of relationships. Some will be formal, uh, but many informal. And we feel that it is right for the word partnership therefore to remain on the face of the bill as this will certainly be an important mode of operation for HES. So we're happy to add the word uh, collaboration as BEFs and the NTS have also suggested to emphasise the wide variety of formal and informal arrangements uh, covered by section 25 and this will also align with the agreed approach of the historic environment strategy our place in time. So the amended wording for this subsection would now read um, and in, I'd quote, work, working in collaboration with other persons in brackets, whether in partnership or in other ways, uh, close brackets, and therefore I move Amendment 9. Mr. Cabinet Secretary, can I call Liam MacArthur? Thank you. Very briefly, I very much welcome these amendments. I think what struck all of us um, in terms of what we witnessed in Orkney was the collaborative approach uh, that was taken there uh, across a range of uh, partners. I think the fact that we're able to underscore that uh, more explicitly in the bill is, is very much to be welcomed, and I think sits quite nicely with some of the amendments we're coming on to in the next grouping, so I welcome that. Very much, um, cabinet secretary, to wind up. Um, yes, and just to, to thank the committee. I think that's also an example of where stage one consideration has enhanced the bill, and that's why we've brought forward this amendment. Thank you. Uh, the question is that amendment nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Uh, can I call amendment two in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with amendments eleven and three? 
Uh, Liam MacArthur to move Amendment 2 and speak to other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I think if there was a defining message from those we met during our visit to Orkney earlier this year, uh, surely it was the need to ensure that the newly merged body takes proper account of the needs, aspirations and indeed the expertise of those uh, on the ground in places uh, like Orkney. A centralised body with a Hess knows best attitude would be uh, the worst of all worlds, um, a view shared pretty much across the board, uh, I'm pleased to say. In essence, what's being sought uh, is a regionalised structure for the operation of HES, so that even where members of staff are not physically located in the areas for which they have responsibility, there is an accessibility and accountability and a responsiveness built into the new uh, organisation from the outset. Capturing this in the bill uh, is not straightforward and almost certainly would be insufficient. This will need to be fully reflected in the overarching strategy for the historic environment, as well as in the corporate plan and budgeting of the newly formed HES. But amendments two and three are an attempt um, to ensure that, as far as the bill is concerned, this expectation is met during the establishment of HES. It would require HES to have regard to local issues and local decision-making processes uh, and ensure the involvement of local communities. I welcome the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has attempted to do something similar in her Amendment 11 and will listen carefully what she has to say in that regard. I appreciate, as I say, that capturing this sort of thing in legal language is not uh, at all easy, uh, that it reflects a philosophy almost as much as a, a structure in any uh, organisation. However, having seen firsthand the level of expertise, collaboration and appetite to protect, enhance and make accessible uh, Orkney's truly world-class archaeology and built heritage, I'm sure colleagues would agree that this is something we should be looking to support through this bill as much as we possibly can. And I move Amendment 2 in my name. Thank you very much. Can I call Cabinet Secretary to speak to Amendment 11 and other amendments in the group? Um, so th these amendments uh, all arise out of the concerns expressed during Stage 1 and in the Committee's Stage 1 report that the Bill may not sufficiently recognise the local dimension and I think in that regard uh, what Liam MacArthur is trying to do is similar to what the Government is trying to do and I think the, the Committee are just going to uh, need to assess what might be the best way forward in, in delivering that. The, the concerns include the importance of communities, uh, the need to take account of local issues and decision-making by local authorities. And as committee will be aware, these are also um, matters at the heart of the historic environment strat strategies work. So I undertook to look at these matters again before stage two, and Amendment 11 is my proposal to address them at this point in the bill. Um, I should emphasise that there will always be a requirement um, on Historic Environment Scotland, as in all public bodies, to, to take into account all relevant factors in undertaking its functions. All relevant factors, of course, include local issues. But to, con to signal how seriously we take this matter, uh, the amendment I've proposed places the interests of local communities alongside national policies and strategies. And so Amendment 11 would change se Section 28 to read, in exercising its functions, Historic Environment Scotland must have regard to any relevant policy or strategy published by the Scottish ministers and, as may be appropriate in the circumstances, to the interests of local communities. At the same time, HES will be a body with a, a national remit uh, local concerns cannot and should not always be the overriding consideration. Therefore, I have proposed an amendment which will require HES to consider the circumstances of each situation. So in conclusion, um, I, in terms of, of reference to Amendment 11, um, I think um, Amendment 11 provides a legal mechanism um, to deliver that local dimension. I, I don't believe Amendment 2 works because the bill at this point is referring to HES working with persons, that is natural or legal persons, such as local authorities, community trusts or similar. Local communities can be hard to define. It might be the occupiers of a small group of houses b beside a monument, for example, or the inhabitants of an island, or even people who do not live locally but feel a special bond to a particular case. So legal definition of local communities is very difficult. Um, HES, like any other public body, will be expected to take account of all relevant factors in reaching its decisions, uh, and that is how public bodies are required to work as a matter of um, first principle. And local decision-making processes are already covered in different areas such as planning, environmental impact assessment and listed building uh, legislation. The bill clearly defines the way in which HES will be required to interact with local authorities in areas where they play uh, formal roles in decision making. Um, but we also need to, to make sure that HES uh, is, is we're conscious that it is a, a national body and while the, the local dimension is hugely important, we wouldn't uh, signal that it was always preeminent, although um, uh, often it will be. Uh, so we have tried to make some ad attention to how we can make sure the principles that I think Liam MacArthur is trying to identify 
um, uh, part of the bill. I think um, Mr McCarthy and I are actually close accord in terms of the principles here that the local dimension matters. Um, I suppose the issue is how do we uh, put it into the bill in a way that has a legal content and bearing that allows us to be meaningful in it. Um, I have responded to the request by uh, the committee at stage one. I did promise to come back at stage two, and that's uh, Amendment uh, 11 is, is an attempt to do that. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call Claire Adamson? Uh, Andrew, um, I, um, can I once again um, uh, agree with Liam MacArthur in, in where he's coming from in, in presenting these amendments? Um, I indicated I want to speak because I did have a query about what was meant by local communities, but I think the Cabinet Secretary has explained the, the, the complexities in actually defining that, and uh, I've listened very carefully to what she said, so I think um, on that basis um, I would be support, tending to support her amendments rather than this particular one. Any other member wish to contribute? Can I just make a small contribution, um, which is uh, really around the, the point at which the, there didn't seem to be any difference between uh, Liam MacArthur and the Cabinet Secretary on this point, on the principle of this point. It's the place at which uh, Amendment 2 is intending to be inserted, which is, I think, as the Cabinet Secretary explained, did give me some concern as well. Um, we, uh, I think, are well used to the, the fact that uh, a, a person can be legally defined and is legally defined often in bills, um, but putting local communities in that same part of the bill may be I think, a bit of a problem. Um, so I, think I agree with Claire Adamson. I think it's uh, certainly safer as well as, I think, more accurate to put it um, as in line 22, I think it is, yes, in section 2, page 2. Uh, that's Amendment 11 uh, proposed by the Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I call uh, Liam MacArthur to wind up and uh, indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Uh, thank you, convener, and to, uh, thanks to, to those who have contributed to the debate on this uh, amendment. I don't think there is any disagreement uh, at all. Um, I, I use the example of, of Orkney to illustrate um, where this, the, this need and, and, and desire arose from, but I suspect um, it is pretty much uniform in, in communities uh, across the country. Um, amendments 2 and 3 were my stab at trying to reflect that, um, but it was a little like nailing jelly to the wall um, uh, in terms of coming up with language uh, that would suit uh, the context of a bill. I think Amendment 11 does it uh, more than adequately for my purposes, so I'm happy to withdraw Amendment uh, 2 and support Amendment 11. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the member has asked to withdraw uh, his amendment. Uh, does anybody object? No objection. Therefore, can I call Amendment 10 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 9, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally? Move. The question is that Amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. Can I call Amendment 61 in the name of Liz Smith in a group on its own? Liz Smith to move and speak to Amendment 61. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, when the National Trust for Scotland and the Historic Houses uh, Scotland supplied their evidence to the Education Committee, uh, they reported the extent of their uh, property maintenance backlogs, which were obviously uh, very significant in terms uh, of money, and that's at a time when the whole historic environment budget is under a huge pressure. Uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, has very uh, correctly said that the whole of the historic environment matters and that ownership, whether that's public or private, is not really the main uh, concern. So Amendment 61 is uh, probing to make it explicit that HES's powers are not limited when it comes to the objects in private ownership. I'd be very grateful for the Cabinet Secretary's response. Can I call Mary Scanlon? Uh, as a bit of a latecomer to this bill, uh, I would also like to seek some clarity here. Uh, there, do, do, there does seem to be uh, real concerns, for example, from uh, the National Trust and indeed the private uh, historic uh, owners who, as Liz said, uh, the backlog National Trust was given at 46 million, historic houses, maintenance backlog 57 and growing. And I think I would add to that the uh, properties in care uh, of 345 properties, 76 are privately owned. So really, given um, <coughs> the funding uh, priorities in this bill, it's really just seeking clarity as to, you know, will those houses in care that are privately owned be treated on the basis of uh, the you know, the priority for the historic environment. Will the National Trust and historic houses 
uh, those that are privately owned, will they be treated equally? Uh, and if I could just uh, convene or finish on the point that was raised in the Historic Houses Association evidence, um, which said that historic environment will be an owner <clears throat> of significant heritage assets, a tourist operator and a regulator, and will also be responsible for awarding taxpayer-funded grants for the sector and at the same time be in competition with the sector. So these are points that were raised and I'm seeking clarity today uh, that everyone will be treated fairly. And I'm sorry, I did say it was my last point, convener, but in the policy memorandum, uh, if the Cabinet Secretary could confirm this point, paragraph 134, uh, it does say it is expected that details of ministerial authorisations and of grant decisions will be published. So given that this is an expectation in the policy memorandum, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary could tell us if, if this will in fact happen uh, and that grant decisions and ministerial authorisations will in fact be published, hopefully on an annual basis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... No other member has indicated they wish to contribute, so can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Yeah, I appreciate the points raised by uh, Liz Smith and, and Mary Scanlon. I, I've said in answer to, to an earlier amendment that one of the things in terms of funding is that we would publish um, the uh, direction from, well, the, the letter of guidance from, from government in relation to funding and what was available for um, uh, non-HES properties, and that would be, be public and could be scrutinised by this committee and indeed others. Um, and she's correct identifying that that uh, indication set out in the policy memorandum and the mechanism I would do that would be th through that letter of guidance. Um, there are no funding priorities in the bill, um, in, the, in the bill is set before you. And also it's important to, again, put on record that Historic Environment Scotland will not own uh, properties in care, but they will do that on, on, on behalf of the owners. Um, the, the role of private owners in protecting and managing our heritage and in making accessible for others uh, to enjoy is, is vital, and it's right to identify that. And it is undoubtedly the case that private owners look after the large majority of our heritage, uh, certainly far more than all our public and charitable national bodies um, added together. So that means not just that HES should support them, it means that HES must support and work with them, or it simply can't deliver its strategic functions. And that is why... Um, We've given HES the power to support and assist any other person, and that, obviously we've just reflected on what that legal definition might be, which includes all private property owners as well as national bodies, existing charities and local authorities. Um, I, I do not think that any other person needs to be expanded. It's already um, all-inclusive. Um, and there is a danger um, that this amendment might actually limit uh, rather than promote HES's role in supporting private owners. Uh, Section 2.6 of the bill is already a comprehensive duty, enabling HES to give support and advice in respect of any function which is of a similar nature to its own functions. So does it matter? I think it might do. The list offered with the amendment focuses just on protection and management. It would not cover, for example, HES assisting private owners to market their historical properties properties as visitor attractions as part of Scotland's overall heritage um, offer. So in, probably inadvertently, I think the amendment is quite narrow in just identifying protection and management. Um, the collaboration that we've just referred to, another amendment uh, uh, where Historic Scotland and the National Trust for Scotland working alongside um, Historic Houses Association, for example, can come together to add value to what everyone does. Um, this brings in visitors whose contributions swell the resource available to private owners as well as help maintain their parts of the shared heritage. So if we're making sure that we're being public about what investment is going into the non-HES grants, that makes that opaque and make, so it makes it more transparent. Um, but also in terms of um, setting out that we actually expect HES in this bill to support all the functions, not just protection and management of the private sector, then I hopefully that will, will, will make it clear um, that our commitment is there and also the, the, the responsibilities of HES will be to those areas. Um, the, uh, I don't want us to, to accidentally restrict how HES, HES is able to work with private owners in the future. I think this amendment might do that. Um, the bill already gives HES the power it needs to work collaboratively and to support and assist any other person um, in doing that, and that's where private owners would be part of that, any other person that's defined there. I think it's fairly comprehensive as it, 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 as it exists, but I think in putting down this amendment, it helps make sure that, as a government, we can clarify those points. Um, I think they're well made, but I hope I've responded in such a way to give you an understanding that 
yes, we're very conscious of one of the importance of um, the private ownership that HES must, must support and work with them as set out in the bill and that we be preferable not to restrict that just to protection and management as set out in the amendment. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call Liz Smith to wind up and to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw her amendment? Uh, th thank you, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That was uh, very helpful in terms of outlining some of the uh, clarity uh, that is required and which is already in the Bill. Uh, on that basis, I'm not moving 61. Because I didn't move it at the start. You should have. <laughs> I, I, think it's, I, think, I, I think it's taken that you have moved it since that's the only amendment in this group oh, well, you've spoken I, may to. I, seek it, to so withdraw it, I think you have to seek to withdraw. I was very does, does any member uh, object to uh, the withdrawal of that amendment? <coughs> no, men, no member objects. Therefore, can I call Amendment 11 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 2. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move. The question is that Amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 3 in the name of Liam MacArthur? Already debated with Amendment 2. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. It's not moved. The question is that uh, Section 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. Can I call Amendment 12 in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with Amendments 13 to 16, 19 to 23 and 59? Uh, Liam MacArthur to move Amendment 12 and speak to other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. I I uh, covered general concerns of moving amendments earlier uh, this morning about the delegation of, of functions, the need to maintain quality and, and accountability. And my amendments in this grouping return to the same principle that I'm very conscious of the comments that the Cabinet Secretary made in relation to those uh, earlier uh, amendments. I understand from uh, speaking to local authorities that there are examples where ministers may uh, d deem it sensible or desirable um, to, to delegate, um, particularly in relation to properties in care or listing. Um, and while I would certainly um, uh, agree that that is a, a sensible approach, I think the public would ex expect that this only to be done uh, where the necessary level of knowledge, skills and, and expertise exists. Um, I note from the amendments the Cabinet Secretary has laid in this grouping that there seems to be a, a, a principle that um, she concurs with. Um, I'm certainly happy to support uh, her amendments in this grouping, but would, uh, would be interested to hear um, her observations in relation to uh, Amendment 12, which I have uh, pleasure in moving, and the others in this grouping. Thank you very much. Uh, Liam, uh, can I call the Cabinet Secretary to okay. speak to Amendment 13 and other amendments in the group? Uh, so, Convener, I'd like to set out the rationale for the, the government amendments in this group, uh, which all relate to uh, the properties in care and associated collection which ministers hold on behalf of the people of Scotland. Um, I believe that uh, Liam MacArthur's amendments 12, 14, 19 and 21 will not be necessary if the government amendments proposed here, which are 13, 15, 16, 20, 22, 23 and 59, are agreed. And, Convener, we have to navigate our way through all these amendments in the same area. Um, <laughs> Uh, with, with this bill, we will ensure that uh, uh, the properties are preserved and made accessible now and in the future through ensuring that the properties are managed by the people with the best skills and expertise. And we need to be able to respond to changing circumstances and to provide what is best for a property, for the estate and for the people of Scotland. Uh, we're committed to openness and transparency in how the properties are managed, and that is why I'm proposing these amendments. Which, which ensure that there is appropriate scrutiny and transparency around the delegation of functions in relation to properties in care. I'm delighted and grateful to the de Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee uh, for their recommendations in their Stage 1 reports, which have informed the thinking behind these amendments. And I indicated at Stage 1 that I would respond directly to the request by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform uh, Committee on this area in particular. So amendments 13, 16 and 59 mean that where ministers wish to delegate functions to persons other than Historic Environment Scotland, these per um, persons should be prescribed by order. And that would be subject to the affirmative uh, procedure. Um, amendments uh, 20 and 23 have the equivalent effect for the Scottish Minister's collections. And this would actually allow parliamentary scrutiny of the super suitability of any proposed candidate for delegation uh, other than HES. And, and quite clearly, that would be an opportunity to question HES about the uh, experience or indeed the capability of that body. So it really is as transparent, I think, as this Parliament would require in his response to um, the Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee. 
amendments 15 and 22 place ministers under a duty to publish any such delegations um, and I, as I confirmed when I wrote to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee it was always my intention that such delegations would be published uh, amending the bill to include these provisions underlines my commitment to transparency uh, these amendments balance the need for future flexibility with the need for scrutiny and transparency, and I believe they effectively address the issue of clarity, which was raised by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee in their Stage 1 report. So I believe that the amendments that are not required um, are 12, 14, 19 and 21, uh, as I think that their effect is achieved by the government amendments in this grouping. Um, so I, I recommend that you approve um, the, other, the remainder of those uh, um, amendments rather than the ones um, that are set out in Liam MacArthur's name at this time. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call Liam MacArthur to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Uh, thank you. Uh, convener, as you say, I think that there's an agreed principle here, and some of the detail will come forward through secondary legislation, but that's probably appropriate um, for the purposes of this. I do think the Cabinet Secretary's amendments uh, address the uh, go some way to addressing the concerns I was trying to uh, to get at. I'll reflect further ahead of stage three, but certainly for now, I'm happy to withdraw those amendments. Amendment 12. Uh, Lee MacArthur has indicated he wishes to withdraw Amendment 12. Uh, does anybody object? No objection. So can I call Amendment 13, the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 12. Cabinet Secretary to move formally? Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 14 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 12. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. That's not moved. Can I call Amendment 15 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 12. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed. Can I call Amendment 16 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 12. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed. Can I call Amendment 17 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 18 and 26. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 17 and speak to all amendments in the group. Okay, Amendment uh, 17, 18 and 26 um, on 17. Um, one of the, the questions raised by the Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee was about the clarity of exactly which properties could and which properties could not be delegated under this bill. Um, the committee's recommendations was that there should be a clearer definition of properties and care in the bill. Uh, studying the recommendation and how it might be brought into effect, it became clear that refining the definition or specifying exclusions uh, would in itself pose challenges. Um, our particular concern was that it might accidentally limit the type of properties that min ministers might take into care. And we have to bear in mind the fact that this bill and the provisions in it need to be sufficiently flexible to take uh, account of future priorities. Uh, much of what we regard as heritage today uh, was not regarded as heritage a generation ago. Um, and industrial archaeology, for example, is a, a good example of that. So we've already found at stage one that definitions can be challenging and we look to find uh, an alternative approach which would meet um, the Delegated Power and Law Reform Committee's requirements. Um, I think uh, and we believe that we've uh, come up with a, a simpler solution which has the advantage of absolute clarity. Um, our proposal is simply to publish a list of exactly which properties held by ministers are to be treated as properties in care and this uh, capable of delegation under this bill. Uh, that's what Amendment 18 does, while Amendments 17 and 26 adjust the bill wording to cross-refer to it. So we will just publish the list. Uh, and that's the simplest and most transparent way we think we can address um, that challenge. And I move Amendment 17. No other member has indicated they wish to contribute. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you have anything to add at this stage? I know. OK, the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. And I call Amendment 18 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 17. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. I move. The question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Sections 4 to 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Can I call Amendment 19 in the name of Liam MacArthur? Already debated with Amendment 12. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? No moved. That's not moved. Can I call Amendment 20 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 12. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, formally moved. Question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
are agreed. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Liam MacArthur, already debated with Amendment 12. Liam MacArthur to move or not move? Not moved. That's not moved. Can I call Amendment 22 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 12. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 23 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 12. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? It's agreed. The question is that Section 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? It's agreed. The question is that Sections 8 to 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call Amendment 24 in the name of Liam MacArthur, grouped with Amendment 25? Liam MacArthur to move, a move Amendment 24 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. You'll be delighted to hear this is the, the last hurrah in terms of my amendments this morning. Um, amendments 24 and 25 uh, seek to ensure local and national bodies work effectively in collaboration, a, a point uh, picked up earlier by uh, the Cabinet Secretary. They also aim to enable decision-making processes, uh, for example, in the often sensitive area of planning, to make best use of all available relevant expertise. Uh, from speaking to local authorities and the Built Environment Forum Scotland, uh, I know there is a desire to see the informal advice and guidance provided to uh, councils by Historic Scotland at present continue as a core function of the new body going forward. Uh, ahead of the Stage 1 debate of this bill, colleagues will, may recall that um, the forum highlighted threats to the frontline role that planning authority officers play in safeguarding the historic environment. In particular, BEFs identified big reductions over recent years in conservation services across Scottish local authorities. They even suggested this trend is continuing and that there are three councils providing planning services with no specialist local conservation uh, uh, advice. All the more important, therefore, that planning authorities have access to appropriate external expertise so that decision makers have the information and advice they need to determine statutory consent applications relating to the historic environment. I understand the government may be concerned that with HES obliged under the bill to provide advice to Scottish ministers, introducing a further obligation uh, for HES to advise local authorities might lead to awkward situations where local authorities are in dispute uh, with the Scottish government. However, uh, while I see these as, as potentially valid, I can't imagine that the situations ar arise anything other than very infrequently, and in which case, presumably, an exception or an exemption clause could be inserted to provide uh, the reassurances that ministers uh, require. As for the argument that such a requirement in the bill might lead to job losses in local authorities across Scotland, uh, it does seem to be the case from BEF's uh, evidence that the horse is already bolted uh, in that regard. As one council official working in this area put it to me recently, quote, the fundamental point is that local authority staff need the support and advice that HES provides, and this is a structural necessity of the overall heritage management system in Scotland. He went on uh, to argue that this must be reflected in the bill and guarantees that the current provision of advice will be maintained uh, are essential. Uh, I agree. I hope the Cabinet Secretary will too, and I move Amendment 24 in my name. Thank you very much. No members have indicated they wish to contribute. Therefore, can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Um, I agree that this is an important area to discuss and explore, but I, I do have concerns. Um, we have already discussed the local dimension when considering amendments 2, 3 and 11, and the committee, of course, gave much thought to this area at stage one. Um, and I believe the major concern in relation to amendments 24 and 25 is that local authorities currently receive support from Historic Scotland, which they value and respect, and that there is a, a real desire that this level of support should be maintained when HES comes into operation. And I think that's the point that Liam MacArthur has already made in his contribution. I've already confirmed that this support will continue, and there is no need for the amendment to, to make it happen. Some forms of hist historic environment knowledge and expertise are scarce. Uh, historic Scotland and RCAMs are sometimes the only sources, and in future this is likely to be the case with HES. Um, local authorities regularly consult the national experts and wish to be re reassured that HES will similarly assist them as required. Uh, I'm happy to give that assurance. Uh, HES will indeed continue to offer a national resource for local authorities and others, and the bill already provides for this. Uh, partnership working with um, and between local and national bodies is important 
important, including the input of RCAMs on sharing and using historic environment records. Again, this will continue, underpinned by strengthening a requirement for collaboration, which we've already debated in the Bill, and by a very active working group uh, within the historic environment strategy. Amendment 24 seeks to place a strict duty uh, on HES. Its effect would be to require HES to be constantly providing advice to local authorities all the time, without any thought um, of the need to deliver its functions more widely. To provide such a service, either resources would need to be diverted from other functions given to HES, or else HES would need to, for example, be able to charge local authorities for this. And one of the assurances I've given local authorities is that we wouldn't add any extra financial burdens onto them as a result of this bill. And I don't think that either of those things are desirable. I don't think it's also what Liam MacArthur intends, in, indeed, in his, his amendment. But I think the bill is drafted um, and enables HES to give advice and support, and that's correct. The change that are in these amendments would also put local authorities on the same footing as ministers and place HES in a subordinate position to them. Uh, that simply won't work. There are various duties on local authorities to consult HES or to notify HES of things. As a statutory consultee, HES has to be able to stand apart from an authority and act independently of it. And finally, there's a, a real danger for local authorities and local communities in these amendments. Most local authorities follow the recommendations of national planning policy and the Scottish Historic Environment Policy and maintain access to local expertise and information, which allows them to deal with historic environment issues. However, there are a few, of the, uh, for their own reasons, who do not. And it's always open to this committee to scrutinise and, and uh, discuss uh, these issues uh, with local authorities in terms of those skills, and, and they can do that uh, independently anyway. If, if Historic Environment Scotland is, is required to act as an on-demand supplier, um, as these amendments set out, then that might actually tempt more local authorities to take the decision to reduce or abandon their own historic environment capacity. I don't think any of us want that to happen. Um, this would work directly counter to the intention we understand lies behind the amendments, uh, which obviously, as Lee MacArthur said, is to retain and strengthen capacity at local level. But I, I think we, we don't want to provide some kind of get-out that would allow local authorities to reduce their own expertise because they can always call on HES in that regard. The end result um, could be counterproductive. It could end up with a more centralised, less locally aware historic environment service, and I don't think MD um, would want to see that. Um, as to, uh, to Amendment 25, I don't think it, I, I believe it's just simply unnecessary, as local authorities are already covered by that term any other person used at this point in the Bill. So for these reasons, I don't believe that the amendments add value to the Bill. Um, indeed, I believe that Amendment 24 poses real risks for HES and for local authorities, and therefore I, I do oppose those two amendments. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call Liam MacArthur to wind up uh, and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Uh, thank you, Convener. I have to start by saying I'm very encouraged by uh, what the Cabinet Secretary had to say about the importance um, of this relationship and ensuring um, that that um, accessibility of the expertise that, that is within NARCAM and, and Historic Scotland at the moment, uh, that that accessibility, accessibility remains the case uh, going uh, forward. I, I, I don't necessarily accept that um, local authorities are likely to be constantly in touch with, with HES, but I do, uh, I think, uh, acknowledge the concerns about the relative relationship between uh, the new body uh, and local authorities. Um, this may be something that um, we need to return to, I think, if there is any diminution uh, in terms of the uh, the, the, the access that local authorities have to that um, expertise um, will be into the territory that I was referring to earlier about a merged organisation that is seen to have retrenched to the centre rather than uh, respecting the, uh, the role it has um, in, in, in providing service and responding to the needs of, of all parts of the country. But I think for the time being, in light of what the Cabinet Secretary has to say, I'm, I'm happy to withdraw uh, Amendment uh, 24 and 25. Thank you. The member has indicated he wishes to withdraw Amendment 24. Does anybody object? No objections. Can I call Amendment 25 in the name of Liam MacArthur? Already debated with Amendment 24. Liam MacArthur, to move or not move? Uh, not moved. It's not moved. The question is that Section 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Liz Smith, grouped with Amendment 5. Liz Smith, to move Amendment 4 and speak to both amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, throughout uh, various stages in this bill, uh, I think there have been issues uh, about uh, where accountability lies for uh, strategic decision making. And that was something that was borne out by uh, comments from some of the witnesses who believe when it came to this issue, there was a slight lack of uh, clarity. 
Uh, when uh, giving evidence to the, uh, this committee on May the 20th, Cabinet Secretary, you indicated that the board of the new body were to have a different opinion uh, with the Scottish Government about strategic direction, then uh, it would be the Minister who would have the final say in what that direction should be. And that's something that you've reaffirmed in your comments uh, earlier uh, this morning. And then you added in a letter to uh, the convener on the 28th of May that if Scottish ministers did not think uh, HES was playing a, suf a sufficiently strong role in addressing matters of concern to the wider cultural sector as captured in the strategy, then they would, uh, and I quote, direct the board of HES to work in partnership and more effectively. Uh, to be specific, uh, paragraph 88 of the policy memorandum says that Scottish ministers will be able uh, to give directions to Historic Environment Scotland about the exercise of its functions, but not on objects or properties as referenced uh, in section 12.2 of the Bill. And that's obviously to ensure uh, operational independence. Uh, section 12.3 uh, of the Bill says that uh, that section 12.2a uh, does not apply when Scottish ministers have delegated functions in relation to properties and care. And I think, again, uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, you affirmed that in uh, oral evidence. Um, in the uh, response that the Scottish Government made to uh, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform uh, Committee, uh, the comment was made that, that the exclusion at subsection 12.3 makes it clear that ministers may, by contrast, uh, give directions in relation to what would be regarded as curatorial matters uh, to those properties and care and collections, the functions in respect of which have been uh, delegated by ministers to HES. So I think it's clear that there are some questions which remain uh, around who will be ultimately responsible for overseeing the delivery of the strategy and how the corporate plan of the historic environment Scotland will align with the already uh, published our place uh, in time. As it stands, I think the consensual uh, language of the historic uh, environment strategy document, which uh, clearly envisages joint working and uh, shared vision, it doesn't entirely sit uh, easily with the clauses in the bill which state that the new body must have regard to any relevant policy or strategy published uh, by Scottish ministers. Uh, amendments 4 and 5 are designed to address this issue, both in terms of clarifying the exact relationship between ministers and the board of HES and limiting uh, scope for uh, ministerial power. And so as not to undermine the compatibility of the bill with other legislation similar to that that governs SNH or Creative Scotland or National Library for Scotland, I think it's important not to remove section 12 uh, altogether, which obviously would have been uh, one option. But I think there is a case to be made for ensuring that HES uh, need not implement the directions under 12.1 if the effect of that implementation would actually not be in line with HES's corporate plan. Um, and obviously the Minister will have been uh, part of the body which agrees that corporate plan, but if any move was made by Ministers to move away from that agreement, then I think that's where there would be questions about accountability. So I move uh, uh, Amendment 4. Thank you very much. Uh, no other member has indicated the wish to contribute at this stage. Uh, can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Uh, Elizabeth uh, is quite right to recognise the importance of the corporate plan, and I completely share that assessment. Um, it's why we've provided in the bill for HES to create a plan and for its approval by ministers. Um, the corporate plan is the linchpin of the corporate performance framework for HES because it will be approved by ministers. We also share um, um, ownership and accountability. Um, the plan is a public document and the performance report for the organisation will be published uh, at least annually. So failure to deliver will be transparent, as will the board's explanations for failure, including the sort of unbalancing direction which Liz Smith appears to have in mind. And indeed, this committee can scrutinise um, um, the plan in session, as it's done with corporate plans um, of other bodies, and indeed call me to account as minister if I should do something that you think, as a committee, is not consistent with the the, the corporate plan itself. Uh, ministerial direction, of course, is not unusual for public bodies, and therefore you know, the, the provision is there. The power of direction is there for good reason, um, and it can, in fact, be used to support uh, Historic Environment Scotland, for example, by clarifying procedural matters, such as how uh, routine sponsorship arrangements will work. These um, amendments seem to assume that I will regularly be issuing directions to HES to do something which HES thinks is a, a bad idea. Um, 
I can, I can say here and now that I will not. Um, in fact, in seven years as a minister, I cannot recall ever uh, issuing a formal direction in uh, opposition to the advice of a, a sponsored body. So that's a quite a serious thing if you're doing that, uh, if any minister is doing that. In my experience, I haven't done that in seven years. It doesn't necessarily mean it won't happen, but it will be quite obvious when it happens as to, to the seriousness of, of, of such a situation. The, the, the chair and board of a NDPB do not require specific provision to raise or challenge any proposals that would significantly compromise delivery of agreed outcomes, such as in the corporate plan. And it is the nature of the sponsorship uh, relationship between government and, government and NDPBs that such matters are explored and usually resolved long before any formal communication or direction uh, would take place. Um, in, in short, a formal direction, especially a formal direction against the advice of a body, is the end of a long process uh, of discussion, not the starting point. Uh, for these reasons, I believe that the amendment would only serve to introduce unnecessary complications into what is a clear and straightforward relationship based on the corporate plan. And since the corporate plan is a, a public document, it can be scrutinised at any level. I can um, obviously be held to account for whether I go counter towards that, counter plan, uh, that corporate plan in giving a, a minister direction. That is exactly the circumstances I would expect the committee to, to call the minister um, to ask what uh, the rationale was and why. Um, I think those mechanisms are already exist and I think in consistent to be consistent um, with other uh, public bodies uh, yes it's important to have the corporate plan but I think it would be wrong to, to think about um, ministerial direction as something that would happen um, often and frequently it would be quite significant if it did and there are plenty of mechanisms uh, for accountability both of me but al also of the, the body in question um, between ourselves minister responsible for the body but also this parliament and this committee. Call Liz Smith to wind up and to indicate whether she wishes to press or withdraw her amendment. Uh, th thank you. Um, I, I hear what you say, Cabinet Secretary, and I, I don't doubt in any way that I think uh, the vast majority of situations there would be the collaboration which you talked about earlier, and it would be very difficult to be in a situation I'm uh, not in any way casting aspersions on the uh, Cabinet Secretary's own role uh, in this. But as you rightly pointed out yourself, th 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 there is potential. It, it could happen whereby there was a, a, a disagreement uh, and that I, some, I think there is still a, a lack of clarity about that kind of situation which uh, could result. So on that basis, I would uh, move Amendment 4. Is that Amendment 4 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? No. Uh, we are not all agreed. There will be a division. Uh, those members who wish to support Amendment 4, Amendment 4 please show. Okay. Those against? Abstentions? The result of the division on Amendment 4, there were four votes in favour, five against and no abstention. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. Can I call Amendment 5 in the name of Liz Smith, already debated with Amendment 4, Liz Smith, to move or not move? Not moved. That's not moved. The question is that Section 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Can I call Amendment 26 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 17, Cabinet Secretary, to move formally? Uh, moved. The question is that Amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Section 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? It's agreed. The question is that Section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Can I call Amendment 27 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group on its own? Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 27. Uh, Convener, this is a, an amendment to tidy up the drafting at this point in the bill, which is presently drafted, allows two slightly different readings. It adjusts the wording of the bill and the changes the bill makes to the 1979 Act to ensure that ministers can set out in regulations timescales for Historic Environment Scotland to notify all those who need to be told that a monument has been added to or removed from the schedule or when an entry relating to a monument has been amended. I move Amendment 27. Member has indicated they wish to contribute. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I don't suppose you need to wind up. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 27 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Can I call Amendment 28 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 29 to 31 and 35 to 41? Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 28 and to speak to other amendments in the group. Um, the call in power in the bill for scheduled monument consent is an, a new power. Uh, it results from the creation of Historic Environment Scotland as a body with a, a separate legal entity to Scottish ministers. The amendments in this group and indeed uh, two of the, set of the subsequent groups 
will, will all stem from the fact that Historic Environment Scotland will not be acting as ministers, uh, unlike the current situation um, where Historic uh, Scotland, for example, can act as ministers. The committee at stage one asked for clarity in rules generally, uh, and that is what these set of amendments um, and indeed the later ones and later groups uh, seek to do. Existing ministerial powers would have allowed us to administer call-in, uh, but we took the view that it would provide greater clarity to set this out in the, on the face of the bill. Um, these amendments set out the processes uh, around call-in of scheduled monument consent. They provide for ministers to determine a case where it has been called in under the power in the bill. Uh, Colin is used when a case raises uh, matters of sufficient importance for ministers to take the decision out of the hands of the usual authority, in this case Historic Environment Scotland, and the power is intended to be used very sparingly. These changes align with those that already exist for listed building consent and as part of our approach to simplifying the role of the historic environment in the planning system. Uh, I'd like to explain a little more uh, the details of specific provisions in these amendments and the requirement from them. Uh, these amendments make clear how ministers are informed that there is a case which might merit call-in and ensure that HES does not reach a decision while such a case is being considered for call-in. They make clear how ministers go about reaching a decision on a called-in case and communic communicating that decision. And finally, they set out the consequences which follow from ministers rather than HES being, having made a decision. Amendment 37 inserts new um, paragraph 2C into Schedule 1 to the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act 79 to ensure that HES is required to notify Scottish ministers of certain specified applications for scheduled monument consent. The specific uh, criteria will be subsequently set out in regulations or directions. This in a, is in effect the trigger. Amendment 37 allows ministers to ensure that we do not see every case HES deals with as very relatively few are likely to raise issues which might make call in worth considering. Amendment 37 also provides the time frame for notification by HES and response from ministers. In essence, we have 28 days to call a case in, to decide that we are not going to call it in or seek more time to think about it. Um, the remaining amendments make technical uh, adjustments to the bill to allow ministers to determine applications which have been called in and to take all the necessary actions for called in cases which HES would have taken had a case not been called in. So although this is a, a large package of amendments, I believe they are necessary to ensure that the call in power for consent already provided for in the bill works effectively and that everyone involved understands exactly who is responsible for which actions at which stage of the process. Accordingly, I move uh, Amendment 28. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Nobody has uh, indicated they wish to contribute to this debate. Um, therefore, I'll move on to the question. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Can I call Amendments 29 to 31, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated? And can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 29 to 31 on block? Uh, moved on block. Thank you. Does any member object to a single question being put on Amendments 29 to 31? Uh, there's no objection, so therefore the question is that amendments 29 to 31 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Um, can I call amendment 32 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with amendments 33 and 34? Cabinet Secretary, to move amendment 32 and speak to other amendments in the group. Uh, these amendments are linked to those we've just considered. I, I believe they are rel relatively simply explained. As we've discussed and agreed, when ministers choose to call in a case for determination, they should take responsibility for the immediate consequences. It would not be fair or equitable to leave uh, Historic Environment Scotland with the responsibility for these when they have not taken the decision. It can arise, though very rarely, that the applicant may have a right to compensation as a result of being refused consent. I should say that the situations in, in which this can occur are very limited and we can find no record of anyone ever successfully seeking compensation. However, in that unusual, if there was an unusual situation that it did arise after ministers had determined a case on call-in, then it would only be equitable that any compensation liability would be for ministers to deal with rather than HES. So these amendments changed the provisions in the bill which adjust the 1979 Act so that this is indeed the case and so that HES is not left with a liability to pay con compensation in respect to a decision that it had not itself made. Thank you very much. Uh, again, no other members indicated they wish to contribute at this stage. Cabinet Secretary, any further comments? Yeah. No. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 33 to 41, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated? 
Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 33 to 41 on block? Moved on block. Uh, can I ask whether any, any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 33 to 41? There being no objection, the question is therefore that amendments 33 to 41 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 42 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, group with Amendments 45, 46, 47 and 48. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 42 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, Convener, I'll speak to Amendments 42 with uh, 45 to 48. Um, the need for this group of amendments flows again from the provision in the Bill for Historic Environment Scotland to issue scheduled monument enforcement notices in future rather than ministers, as is currently the case. I should explain that scheduled monument enforcement notices are very rare. Indeed, they can be issued to someone who already has a scheduled monument consent but appears not to be complying with its terms or when someone has carried out works without consent. And notices are normally only issued after all other forms of resolution have been exhausted. One immediate consequence of the change in the Bill to HES uh, issuing these notices is an opportunity to align processes. Until now, scheduled monument enforcement notices have been issued by Historic Scotland acting for ministers, so appeal has been to sheriffs um, to ensure that there is a clear separation of decision-making and appeal functions. Now that uh, HES will have an independent existence, our intention is that the appeal should be to ministers, as is already the case for appeals against similar notices in respect of listed buildings. These amendments uh, support the simplification agenda as laid out in the policy memorandum for the bill by helping to harmonise different types of heritage management regulation and to align more closely with the planning system. This in turn helps to ensure that clarity and separation of roles exists between HES, local authorities and ministers while retaining appropriate ministerial oversight. These uh, amendments are, in my view, very necessary and beneficial in clarifying roles, uh, which I know the, the committee is keen on doing, and also aligning processes. Accordingly, I move Amendment 42. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. No other members indicated they wish to contribute. Uh, therefore, the question is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, can I call Amendment 43 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Group with amendments 44, 49, 50 and 51? Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 43 and uh, speak to other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, a few minutes ago, we looked at the arrangements for ministers to call in scheduled monument consent cases for determination, and we've just considered some of the arrangements around scheduled monument enforcement notices. The five amendments I wish the committee to consider now bring these two matters together. If the recipient of a scheduled monument consent is failing to adhere to the conditions of that consent or has undertaken works without consent, it is only right that the responsibility for any enforcement action should fall to ministers where ministers made that decision and to HES where HES made that decision. These amendments changed the provisions in the bill which addressed the 1979 Act so that this would be the case, so that HES is not burdened with the responsibility of issuing enforcement notices in respect of a decision which was taken by ministers on call in. So I move Amendment 43. Cabinet Secretary, no other member has indicated the wish to contribute. Uh, therefore, the question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Um, can I call amendments 44 to 51, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated? Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 44 to 51 on block? Uh, moved on block. Thank you. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 44 to 51? Uh, there being no objections, the question is that amendments 44 to 51 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Uh, the question is that Schedule 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. The question is that Section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Uh, can I call Amendment 52 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Group with Amendments 53, 54, 55, 56 and 57. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 52 and speak to other amendments in the group. Um, amendments 52 to 56 are necessary to support our policy intention to include a mechanism which enables Scottish ministers to set out which classes of listed building or conservation area application planning authorities need to consult Historic Environment Scotland on before they grant or refuse consent. The need for these amendments became clear as we engaged with stakeholders around the design of the new system in secondary legislation. Uh, stakeholder engagement to date suggests strong support for a filtering mechanism at, consul uh, at consultation stage in the process to enable local level decisions to be taken locally, with the national body being consulted only on those classes of application where a national perspective adds value. 
The application of such a filter is wholly consistent with the principles of planning reform as it will help streamline the system, aid transparency and ensure an appropriate balance of local and national government. Again, an issue that has come up in this committee a number of times. Applying the filter at consultation stage rather than waiting till applications are notified to Scottish ministers also ensures that the expertise that rides, uh, resides within the historic environment of Scotland is utilised to best effect. Amendment 57 will align, align the handling of cases where Minister Colin is contemplated for listed building and conservation area consents so that it operates in the same way as for the planning system, offering consistency across the wider sector. Our intention, as always, is to uh, call in cases only where there, there is no other way of resolving issues of national s significance. At present, if an application involves an extensive, an extensive package of works to list a building, all of which are, are good conservation uh, practice except for, for one important item uh, which is not, the only option ministers have is to call in the application for determination or let it proceed unchallenged. With this amendment, it will become possible for ministers to indicate to the planning authority that if the one unacceptable aspect is addressed in conditions, then the case will not be called in. This measure will serve to reduce the number of listed building and conservation area consent cases which need to be called in. Uh, it will also offer uh, absolute clarity for all parties about exactly what issues or which issues are giving rise to concern and how they can be resolved. Accordingly, I move Amendment 52. No other member has indicated they wish to contribute, uh, therefore I will go to the question. The question is that Amendment 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are agreed. Can I call Amendments 53 to 56, all in, the name of the all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated? Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move Amendments 53 to 56 on block? Uh, formally moved. On block. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on Amendments 53 to 56? Uh, there are no objections, therefore the question is that amendments 53 to 56 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. The question is that Schedule 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Schedule 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Sections 17 and 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Schedule 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that sections 19 to 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Can I call Amendment 57 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with Amendment 52. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. I formally moved. The question is that Amendment 57 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. The question is that section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? It's agreed. Can I call Amendment 58 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? In a group on its own, Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to Amendment 58. Uh, convener, I'll speak to Amendment 58. And this amendment is required to enable a local authority to determine applications for consent made by themselves for the demolition of a building within a conservation area rather than ministers as is currently provided for in the Listed Buildings and Conservation Areas Act of 1997. It is our intention to change the regulations so that local authorities can determine their own listed building consent applications and this amendment will bring the process for demolition in conservation areas into line with what is envisaged for the listed building consent process and thus with the wider planning system. As I've just mentioned, the process of local authorities determining, determining their own applications, that is applications where they are the developer or owner, is already established practice in the wider planning system. Checks and balances are in place to ensure that the process works smoothly and we are replicating those checks and balances here. Local authorities will be required to consult HES before making a decision and to notify ministers in certain circumstances which will be set out in regulations so that a case can be called in for ministerial determination. I'm satisfied that these measures will provide adequate, uh, adequate scrutiny of the system while allowing for an increase in responsible local decision making. I accordingly, I move Amendment 58. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. No other member has indicated they wish to contribute. Uh, therefore, uh, the question is that Amendment 58 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Can I call Amendment 62 in the name of Neil Bibby in a group on its own? Neil Bibby to move and speak to Amendment 62. Thanks, Convener. I move Amendment 62. The objective of Amendment 62 is to ensure that local authorities are able to handle the management of the historic environment within house or through shared services. Scottish planning policy and Scottish envi historic environment policy say that local authorities can or should have access to relevant expertise and information. 
but reports have shown that capacity is increasingly stretched and there is widespread concern in the sector that frontline conservation and archaeology services are increasingly vulnerable. One such report from December 2013 stated that Scottish conservation services are contracting with 15% reductions estimated over two uh, years. As we have already discussed this morning, expert knowledge on the historic environment is important if authorities are to deliver on national policy commitments, uh, which is what my uh, amendment seeks to do. Uh, the amendment would allow flexibility for expertise to be located in house or through shared or contracted services. I appreciate these uh, amendments are similar um, in uh, ethos to what um, Lee MacArthur was proposing in amendments 24 and 25, and I note what the Cabinet Secretary has said in relation to these early amendments. Uh, I would therefore um, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's comments on amendments 62 and any reassurances that the Cabinet Secretary can offer to allay um, any, any concerns that there are in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, no other member has indicated they wish to contribute at this stage, so can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Um, yes, Convener. I, I suppose I would remind the, the Committee that the, the, the purpose of the Bill is to establish Historic Environment Scotland and what it does as, a, a, as an organisation. And I think we've got to be very careful as to what duties and responsibilities we um, uh, we use this bill for to um, uh, to load local authorities with uh, other duties and responsibilities, and that's what the core of this amendment, I think, does. We've just discussed um, the question of uh, Historic Environment Scotland's advice and support to local authorities in a previous amendment. Uh, this amendment looks at, at the same matter, but it does so from the local authorities' uh, perspective. Uh, local authorities already play a very full role in protecting, managing and promoting enjoyment of our historic environment. Um, as Councillor Hagen of Cosless said at the launch of the historic environment strategy, local government has a crucial role in managing and promoting the historic environment as a positive element for individuals and their local communities alike. Um, there is already clear guidance in the Scottish planning policy which states, and I quote, planning authorities should have access to a sites and monuments record and or a historic environment record that contains information about known historic environment features and finds in their area. In the Scottish historic environment policy, uh, the guidance is even clearer. They should also ensure, I quote, they should also ensure that they have access to sufficient information and suitably qualified and experienced staff to meet their needs. Um, we have commissioned the Institute of Historic Building Conservation to undertake research into the capacity and operations across uh, Scotland's local authority conservation services. Uh, this has confirmed that, and I quote, Scotland's conservation services continue to cope despite ongoing financial pressures, thanks not least to the dedication of skilled conservation staff. Um, it's my view that the existing guidance sets out very clearly what responsible uh, local authorities should do, uh, and I don't believe that we should make this into a statutory duty. It's quite a serious point about what we as a government or what we as a parliament uh, do in terms of uh, providing statutory duties to local authorities in a bill which is ostensibly about what historic environment Scotland's responsibilities should be. Um, I, I think it's far better to work together in partnership with local authorities through our shared strategy, and they're a core part of the, the forum that I've established to take forward the strategy and the supporting working groups to look at and resolve any issues here. Um, a good example of what we can achieve in this way is already visible. The Scottish Historic Environment Data Strategy um, was launched on the 9th of April 2013. It's a collaboration between national and local government experts to ensure that historic environment knowledge and skills are pooled to best effect. It's been widely welcomed in Scotland and beyond and is exactly the sort of innovative joint working that we need if we're to deliver upon that collective ambition for the historic environment, which has been a thread right through um, the strategy and indeed um, the establishment of the bill. If there are local authorities who are not following guidance for whatever reasons, I believe that we should help them by working with them through shared projects uh, such as SHED rather than necessarily a strategy duty um, imposed upon them from this committee or this parliament. Um, we're not complacent on the issue and the role of maintaining advice, expertise and skills across the historic environment are key issues for the strategy to address and several groups established as part of the strategy are looking at this, including the local and national government joint group on the historic environment. And I believe that working together collaboratively with our local authority partners is the best way of addressing issues such as these. But it's a theme that I know we've kept coming back to. It was raised, I think, in terms of Lee MacArthur's 
um, amendments as well. But the, the issue is here is does this bill respect the rights of local authorities to determine their own resourcing or are you going to use this bill uh, in a way that wasn't its intention originally because the intention of the bill is about establishing Historic Environment Scotland uh, to add a, a, a burden which local authorities themselves have not asked for um, as part of this bill process. So um, my view is that we, we should oppose this amendment. Can I call Neil Booby to wind up and to indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Just to uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for her comments. Um, so I'll reflect on the discussion and I'll seek to withdraw the amendment. Uh, thank you very much. The member has indicated he wishes to withdraw the amendment. Does any member object? There's no objection. <coughs> the question is that section 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're agreed. Can I call amendment 59 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary? Already debated with amendment 12. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, moved. The question is that Amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. The question is that Section 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 25 and 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. The question is that Schedule 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 27 to 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <clears throat> the question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That ends stage two consideration of the bill. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and her officials for attending as our next item is in private. I now close the meeting to the public.